Um, so I'm going to start recording here and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, all right, can we see that? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Uh, so this week we're going to talk about kind of my wheelhouse, which is land use planning. Um, something I, uh, I do for my day job and uh, I think is very important. Um, part and parcel to land use planning is, uh, you know, kind of thinking long term, um, thinking far off into the future, um, thinking about future generations uh, and, and, you know, kind of what you're leaving for, for the people who come after you. So there, there's a lot of areas of land use planning that I think um, are really well suited to incorporation of Indigenous knowledge, uh, of Indigenous perspectives. Um, the thing that I've noticed a lot about land use planning is that the process of land use planning, which we're going to get into more next week, um, is very Western. So although a lot of uh, land use planning right now, uh, kind of where we're at in the field, uh, is that we're trying to incorporate uh, and validate and, and see things from more of an Indigenous perspective, uh, bring in Indigenous knowledge holders and put them in positions of uh, decision making and authority so that they can have influence over the planning process. Um, but we haven't changed the planning process itself too much. Uh, and I'm going to get into that a bit more next week, but I think it's something we're thinking about. Um, so today's topics, we're going to talk about uh, the types of land use planning, the scales of plan, and it says here the planning process. I actually found that the lecture is getting a bit long. Um, and actually, instead of that, what it should say is that we are actually going to talk about uh, the next assignment, which is a planning present or a, a plan presentation. So um, we'll get into that at the end of the lecture, but it's going to be a, a pretty simple assignment where you take a, a an existing plan. I have lots of examples posted up on the website um, and you kind of analyze it uh, through the, the assignment. Um, and we'll discuss that at the end of, the end of today. So we'll get into the types of land use planning right off the bat here. So um, what is land use planning to start? It's a good place to start. Uh, land use planning largely concerns legislation, um, policy, uh, and adopting, you know, things like statutes, regulations, you'll hear about zoning bylaws. Um, yeah, codes, policies, whatever you want to call it, they're, they're rules uh, that we're creating to say what is appropriate where, you know, what, um, you know, you don't want to have uh, a factory next to uh, where somebody lives, you know, all that pollution coming out, uh, and then, you know, uh, or right next to a school or something like that. Um, a really popular one uh, to discuss right now is you don't want to have a, a weed store uh, right next to an elementary school. Um, and that was, that was kind of a hot topic in, in Whitehorse a couple of years ago when they were trying to figure out where they were going to put the weed store. Um, so you want to uh, organize your city in such a way that things make sense as, as good neighbors. You know, uh, a certain land uses don't make sense next to one another. And uh, let's, let's avoid that. Um, the general kind of forms of, uh, of zones or uh, designations that you would give to an area would be uh, residential. So that's, you know, dwellings where people live. You're looking at houses, townhouses, condo buildings, apartments, things like that. Um, commercial, uh, so, you know, uh, stores, storefronts, uh, yeah, retail shops, office buildings, things like that. Uh, industrial areas, um, that can involve both light industrial, which is just, you know, I need a garage uh, to store a bunch of uh, equipment or heavy industrial where you're actually doing manufacturing. Um, and then there's, you know, municipal services, uh, schools, police stations, fire stations, courthouses, things like that. Um, these are very general. You know, and they're uh, often they'll overlap with one another. You know, a lot of municipal buildings are just office buildings, um, things like that. So there's, there's not necessarily a strict line between any of these things. Um, so as part of land use planning, uh, you want to talk to the community. The people who know an area best are the people who live there. That's universally true. 
Um, so, you know, you talk to the, the community and the stakeholders, um, you let them know what they have influence over, um, and you allow them influence, you know, you, you allow them to make actual decisions about where they live. That's an important part of land use planning. Um, if you don't allow the people who live in that area to uh, decide what's best for it, you're really kind of, uh, you're ignoring some really valuable knowledge. Um, in larger scales of planning, the people who might know an area best might be the hunters, for example. Um, you know, on, on a regional scale plan, where you're not necessarily planning for uh, a city, but instead creating a plan for a large piece of wilderness, um, the people who are out on the land are going to know that land best, uh, and they're going to have, uh, you know, the best information for it. So uh, a lot of times you're looking to hunters, you're looking to people who are out on the land, uh, you know, snowmobiling or whatever, um, whatever they're up to. Um, so generally speaking, um, the strategic urban planning, um, and this is, this is from an old urban planning textbook of mine. Um, it focuses on three high level goals, uh, you know, or sorry, not three high level goals, high level goals. Um, yeah, so strategic plans, they focus on a problem. So uh, Harlan mentioned that he was involved with the grizzly bear uh, conservation plan, I believe it's called. Um, that, that might be considered a strategic plan in many ways. It's a conservation plan. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, focused on the conservation of, of grizzly bears and, and what we can do uh, to avoid, you know, um, interactions with grizzly bears that are, are, you know, not good for them or for us. Um, but that is kind of, you know, in a large scale like that, it's a strategic plan because you're creating a strategy to dealing with, with a single problem. Um, so often strategic plans are focused on one problem. Um, yeah, they might be called something different. They can be called development plans, core strategies, comprehensive plans, conservation plans would be another one. Um, yeah, I think that's enough about strategic planning. Uh, we'll get into that a bit more when we talk about uh, specific plans in the Yukon. Um, master planning is another type of planning. This is, uh, you know, when you're creating an entire uh, neighborhood, you know, you're, you, you lay out all the lots that would be involved in the streets, you lay out the infrastructure, um, you look at, you know, who's gonna build, who's going to, you know, what sort of uses you want in that area, um, what sort of amenities you might want. Uh, so amenities, you know, a lot of the time you look at a coffee shop or a grocery store, uh, hardware stores are very important, things like that, where people can, um, you know, go out and get the things that they need. Um, so uh, master planning, you know, envisions a future state of a given space uh, and, you know, you have to consider the zoning, the infrastructure, um, yeah, what types of zo uh, zones in, in terms of, is this gonna be a residential area, commercial, light industrial, so on. Um, and then looking at the uh, amenities and facilities like schools, parks, things like that. So that's master planning. It's, it's, um, it's not site specific, so it's not just one lot of land. Um, and it's not citywide either. It's kind of this, you know, a large chunk of land uh, for lack of a, of a better explanation. Um, urban revitalization is a, a popular thing that you see in, in cities these days. Um, a lot of the time in, you know, in cities, especially looking back at the, the 60s and 70s, uh, during what they, they call the white flight, when uh, suburbs were becoming very popular uh, in North America and affluent white families were moving out of the city, urban areas entered a state of decline because there was not a lot of investment in the urban centers. Um, urban revitalization looks for the early symptoms of that. So that it looks for early signs that an area might be in decline and asks that cities and city planners um, you know, invest in that area before it actually declines too much. Um, it, 
you know, it, it helps to, uh, to think about this as an investment in, in the city's culture and well being. Um, you know, it's kind of a, an early triage of issues that can happen uh, in cities. Um, yeah, uh, improvement tactics uh, depend on the root cause of the decline um, and trying to target that, but often developing infrastructure, um, you know, trying to put rent controls in place and things like that uh, tend to happen. So these are all very urban focused so far, but we're gonna move more rural um, after economic development. Uh, ec economic development is kind of uh, this old school idea that you would attract um, well, urban er, economic development in an urban planning sense is an old school idea that you would attract uh, a business to your city. That business would create jobs and prosperity for your city. Um, seems like a really great idea, but it's becoming less and less popular now as the focus of cities stops being a place to provide jobs for people and starts uh, more and more to focus on creating a, a positive, safe, uh, you know, livable space that people desire to live in. Um, people are less tied to their jobs than they used to be. They move around a little bit more and they're more likely to stay planted in a, in a place they like as opposed to uh, staying in a, in a job. Um, you know, it used to be that you'd work a job for 25 or 35 years um, and then be the same job. That's less common these days. Um, and working remotely, uh, especially now, is, is becoming more and more common. So cities have largely stopped trying to attract specific businesses to their towns and have instead tried to focus on how, you know, how do we make the lived experience of the city good? Um, you look at a place like the city of Whitehorse, which is, I think, a very desirable place to live. Uh, a lot of their investments are going into trail systems uh, and things like that because the residents of the city of Whitehorse get a lot out of that and they like those things. Um, uh, environmental planning, uh, uh, definitely on the rise, um, becoming more and more popular um, and more important in a lot of ways. Uh, as cities create more environmental policies, they need better ideas uh, or better information on, you know, how to plan an area. Um, it used to be that you would look for maybe one or two specific species. Um, those lists have grown. Uh, you know, you're, you're looking at all this, the migratory bird acts and all of these uh, sorts of environmental pieces of legislation. Um, and environmental planning is, is a type of strategic development that emphas emphasizes sustainability. So you're really looking at, you know, how do we create um, a sustainable, stable ecosystem, uh, not just outside of the city, but also within it. There's a lot of species that, that live, um, you know, within cities and cities also need to be permeable to migratory species. Um, the city of uh, Toronto a couple of years ago implemented a, uh, a sustainability plan. And I know a lot of people think of the uh, city of Toronto as kind of this, you know, giant piece of trash on the landscape or something. Um, but their environmental plan was targeting um, migratory birds that they passed a, a couple of years ago. And since they've passed that plan, um, they estimate that migratory bird deaths are down uh, 70 to 85% uh, throughout the city. Um, they identified, you know, ways that they could make the skyscrapers essentially more, uh, more visible to birds. And what was happening was, um, you know, migratory flocks were moving through the city uh, and they were uh, breaking their necks on, on skyscrapers. So they found all these innovative ways to make the, these buildings very visible and obvious to migratory birds so that the birds themselves could avoid it. Um, it's, yeah, that's been one of the big successes in recent years in Canada. And uh, that type of thinking uh, is very, very important. As we build on the landscape, we need to think about, you know, who else lives here? Um, and how do we plan for their well-being as well? And we also have a lot of making up, uh, you know, ground to make up in that regard. We've spent, you know, 150, uh, 200 years building up uh, cities in Canada that are, uh, you know, pretty unsustainable. Um, 
in the Yukon, yeah, we have a, a century, a little bit more than a century here of building structures, um, paving over wetlands and things like that, that really have had a serious impact on um, the well-being of the ecosystems here. So it's uh, the environmental planner's job to look at that damage and try to uh, chart a path forward that you know heals the landscape and heals those ecosystems. Finally, uh, I'll talk about infrastructure planning. Um, it's fairly simple, you know, providing providing uh, water, um, sewage, electricity, tele telecommunications, schools, hospital parks, roads, police facilities, fire facilities, things um, that are kind of the, the bones of a city. Um, you know, it's become quite, you know, expected that, that cities provide these things. And in fact, uh, by providing these things, cities can have a drastically reduced impact on um, the ecosystems and environments around them. By treating your wastewater properly, uh, by sourcing your water uh, appropriately and using it efficiently, um, by having an efficient uh, you know, energy network uh, and things like that, uh, cities do have a massive influence on you know, the impact that each person who lives within that city has on the environment. So, um, you know, when thinking about sustainability and environmentalism, uh, infrastructure can't be overlooked. That's the boring part of the lecture now. So we're gonna talk more about more about the North, uh, specifically Yukon. Uh, so in the Yukon, um, there are, you know, multiple levels or scales of plan. So a territorial wide plan would look something like the grizzly bear management plan that uh, Harlan worked on. Um, you know, often territorial plans will be uh, strategic in nature. They won't necessarily be a land use plan. They won't lay out zones or things like that. Um, maybe on a very, very broad level. You can see with the chart I've got here, the least detailed plans are the largest ones. When, um, when you have a territory uh, the size of Yukon, uh, you can't get very specific with, uh, you know, with your plan. If you're gonna do the whole thing, then it's gonna have to be pretty general. Moving down, we've got regional planning. It's still in Yukon, regional planning is a massive uh, scale. Um, Sub-regional and district plans are very ill-defined. I'll get into that. Uh, local area planning is intended for unincorporated communities. Um, so areas where there are populations, but there aren't municipalities. So a municipality being uh, an incorporated city or something like that. Um, you know, you think a lot about uh, areas like Fox Lake, Fish Lake. People live in these places, but they're not really in a city. Um, then there's master planning, which I mentioned, master planning, um, you know, a, a chunk of a city, uh, a new neighborhood or subdivision. And then there's site planning, which is uh, on that site specific scale where you're being really specific and, and uh, very detailed. So I'll skip over territorial plans a little bit. Um, we're not going to get too, too into them. Um, they're often done in consultation with, you know, uh, First Nations or the Council of Yukon First Nations. Um, they might be done in, in collaboration with, uh, with stakeholders like CPAWS or Yukon Conservation Society. Um, they are very general and they're not, um, yeah, they're, they're not necessarily dealing with a specific, um, a specific spot but they will uh, you know often target a problem um, another example would be the off-road vehicle regulations that um, that you know have been kind of in the news recently and stuff um, <clears throat> how are what is an appropriate use of off-road vehicles uh, in the city of whitehorse might be completely different from you know up in old crow so um, you can't get too too specific uh, if you're if you're gonna do something that's um, yeah if you're gonna do something that's on a territory scale again um, just a reminder of the scale that we're looking at here and um, when considering uh, regional planning 
which I'm going to talk about next. Uh, it's very important to take a look at that, that map on the, the right there. Um, in regional planning, the parties are made up of Yukon government and the First Nations in the area. So you can see there's, you know, scarcely any, I think, you know, maybe there's some places that, uh, according to that map, First Nations don't have traditional territory. Um, it's worth noting that this map of traditional territories is a product of uh, the umbrella final agreement. Um, and it isn't necessarily 100% historically accurate, but it is legally accurate. Um, and you look at a lot of these areas, and there's a lot of overlap, right? There's, uh, you know, you, you look around the city of Whitehorse here. Um, we've got Carcross Tagish, we've got to on Kuchan Council, we've got Kwanlin Dunn, Champagne Asia, Teslin Clinket, Little Salmon Carmax. It's, you know, there's a lot going on here. So if you're going to create a regional plan in this area, everyone here has decision making power over that plan. Um, so it's, it's something that's very important. It's also, it's tricky because everyone here might not have the same objectives or goals. They might not have the same problems that need addressing. Uh, and they might be at, at different stages in self-government. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a tricky thing to do, uh, regional planning. And it's, uh, it's very important that, you know, when it's done, it does address the problems of, you know, each of the parties. Um, so <clears throat> regional planning, a very general type of plan. It's governed by chapter 11 of the umbrella agreement and the final agreements of settled First Nations. Uh, these plan can, plans can designate areas that should be considered for development and or resource extraction. Again, this is at a very general level. So you look at a plan like the, the Peel regional plan, uh, it lays out areas where you can consider resource development and where you can't. It doesn't really get into the weeds of, you know, if you are going to go ahead and do, uh, uh, you know, resource development or something like that uh, in an appropriate area. It doesn't lay out further regulations. Um, it just, it lays out appropriate ways, um, you know, to, to engage with the, the communities and come up with those regulations um, and figure out a way forward. But at a general level, it is kind of you can or you can't. Um, this is a, a conservation area where you cannot do consider development activities. So, you know, if somebody were to come forward with a proposal um, for a, a mine in a, a conservation area, it's quite easy for the assessors to just say no, like it's in the plan. Not allowed to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, resource extraction, they can have a general zoning regulation uh, and, and that is enforced by Yukon Land Management Branch. So now this is um, not necessarily 100% accurate, but the Yukon Land Use Planning Council, which is a creation of chapter 11 of the Umbrella Agreement. Um, Chapter 11 lays out a, a process, you know, who's involved for regional planning. Um, so this is generally what the, the planning districts will look like. It's not exact. Um, we do know that North Yukon, uh, the Peel watershed look very much like this. Dawson looks a little bit different. The Dawson uh, planning process is underway right now. Um, yeah, and you know, when considering this, uh, uh, to give you an idea, the Peel watershed, uh, this one up here, is, I mean, it, it's larger than the province of New Brunswick. It's, it, when thinking about the scale, it's it's enormous. So, yeah, I think uh, you know, it's it's one of the largest scales of planning uh, that exists in Canada is regional planning in the Yukon. Um, I actually looked this up. Um, the Satu region of Northwest Territories actually is the largest uh, single tier planning region in Canada, uh, which Ryan might be familiar with. Um, so they're not, you know, we don't have the, the title of largest 
planning areas, but they're very, very big. And as a result, it's, it's hard to get site specific with them. Um, so then there's sub-regional planning. Uh, I'm not sure if I don't, I haven't been able to find evidence of a sub-regional plan ever being completed in Yukon. Uh, the scale has never been defined, uh, but it is also a creation of chapter 11 of the umbrella agreement. Um, so at some point, we're going to have to figure out what a sub-regional plan is. Um, district planning, there is one, I believe. Uh, I, I can't remember what it was. Um, it's, again, very ill-defined. Um, it falls somewhere between regional and local area planning, same as, as sub-regional planning. But it is unclear uh, you know, exactly what district plans are and what function they serve at this time. They haven't really been clarified yet. Local area planning is uh, uh, becoming one of the more common forms of planning outside of, well, it is the most common form of planning outside of uh, cities um, or municipalities. So uh, governed by the self-government agreements, not the umbrella agreement, but self-government agreements of settled First Nations, local area planning is intended to manage uh, population areas of unincorporated communities. So areas that aren't a municipality, but have a lot of people living in them. Um, very common are areas surrounding uh, the, the city of Whitehorse, looking at, you know, Marsh Lake, Fish Lake, Fox Lake, um, you know, areas, areas like that. I know uh, Hot Springs Road, has a local area plan, uh, Mount Lorne has a local area plan. So there's a lot around the city of Whitehorse that, uh, that have uh, local area plans. Um, local area plans are a lot more specific than regional plans. And they're able to provide a lot more guidance on what is an appropriate activity in a site specific way. So because it's a smaller uh, scale, you're able to really get into to the weeds of, you know, okay, well, here's, you know, here's what I would like as my next door neighbor, uh, that sort of thing. You know, here, here is a zoning bylaw that is specific and intentional. Um, you can also, you know, map the migratory routes uh, and wetlands and things like that on a much more detailed level and get a lot better information in the formation of these plans. These plans are very, very useful. Um, they set out uh, specific zoning regulations uh, and decide on, you know, what appropriate development in that area looks like. Um, so I'm going to use the Marsh Lake local area plan as an example. <clears throat> so this is, and try not to go cross-eyed, it's a, this is the zoning bylaw for, uh, for Marsh Lake, uh, or por a portion of Marsh Lake. Uh, where the local area plan exists. So can you guys see my cursor? If I point at things? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, this is gonna be really hard without the cursor. Um, so you can see here environmental open space one. So that would have a specific uh, definition in the plan. Um, you know, it, it would also come with specific uh, regulations, but you can see, okay, environmental open space one here, 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 you know, quite a few places. Um, you know, uh, let's think about commercial. So Marsh Lake, not a whole lot of commercial activity going on uh, right now. And you can see that the intention is that, yeah, okay, we're gonna allow some commercial here. I don't really see much else on this map. Um, so not a lot of commercial, not gonna be much of a commercial area. Community use, um, you know, you've got the Army Beach subdivision area um, with a residential lakefront, that, that orange there, residential lakefront. So um, then you've got more residential lakefront uh, down in the Judas Creek subdivision, more community use. So this makes a lot of sense, right? Like community use um, often associated with uh, maybe trail networks or things like that, uh, gathering spaces. Um, you can see they've got a marina, residential marina right here. So you can start to see, um, you know, the intention behind all this. 
And this isn't just a map of what is, but this is what is allowed. So when you're looking at this map, um, you know, there may not be houses in some of these orange places yet, but that's where you would put one in the future. Um, so you can see how detailed and specific this map is. Um, and it's quite intentional, right? Like by dis having these discussions with the community, you can get to know what they want for the area, what they think is appropriate for the area. Um, yeah, I mean, the people who uh, are most invested in this area needs need to be the ones who, who end up uh, making a lot of the calls on it. Um, a danger of that approach can often be that people don't want their areas to change very much. And, you know, change happens whether or not uh, it's planned. So in a lot of cases, um, planners have to look forward to the future at the changes that will happen, uh, regardless of whether or not uh, community members necessarily want those changes. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure what those considerations would have been in, in uh, the creation of this um, plan, but this is this map here. This is one way of looking at it, right? This is the the development side of things. Another way of looking at a sim, the same area. So here's Marsh Lake again, part of the same plan in the same plan, um, and you can see you know wildlife key areas. So here we've got you know bald eagle habitat. We've got golden eagles up here in the mountains in the higher areas. Uh, you know uh, various seasons uh, and functions for waterfowl. So you know uh, Marsh Lake is you know famously there's there's Swan Haven on Marsh Lake, where you know thousands and thousands of uh, swans gather uh, during their migration. Um, you can see that's true here in, in Michi Lake and, and Fox Lake up here. Um, so, you know, another way of looking at, at the same area is, okay, well, you know, how does this area function for, you know, non-human residents? Um, and you can see it obviously serves quite a few, and there were many of these maps. It wasn't, this is uh, mostly for waterfowl and raptors. Um, but of course, there were there were other species considered, uh, caribou, which have a migratory range up here as well. Um, oh, I spoke too soon. So here <laughs> is the Carcross caribou herd winter habitat. So you can see uh, the winter habitat uh, outlined in in this oh, in the the yellow. So you know when you go back to uh, the development map, you can see the development is very much focused along the shoreline and the areas that are maybe most desirable to, uh, to people. Um, but they're also looking at, you know, providing more open space um, further up. And it, unfortunately this map isn't zoomed out enough, but there's more uh, up above, uh, more environmental open space where the caribou herd would end up coming through here. So, it's important, you know, when looking at, at the future, not to develop in certain areas uh, and to make a plan that says, okay, we need to target development at areas where it's going to have the least amount of impact on, uh, you know, things like the, the caribou's winter habitat here. Uh, and you can see, you know, the level of detail in these plans uh, it keeps on going. Like they're, they're, they're quite detailed plans. They're, it's a good planning tool to use. Um, yeah, I think it's very useful. Uh, municipal planning is focused on planning uh, within uh, a city limit. So uh, yeah, behind me here, I've got a map of the city of Whitehorse. Um, I should have probably put that on uh, here, sorry. Uh, but it's, you know, it's uh, municipal planning is very different. It's, it's controlled by the municipality. So a municipality can, you know, pass their own zoning bylaw with their own zones in it. So similar to the, the zones that we see here, each one of these zones would have specific regulations. Um, how many dwellings are allowed in this zone? You know, how many people can live there? Um, or not how many people can live there, but, you know, uh, uh, commonly you'll see on an agriculture 
designation like this, um, that there's, you know, one dwelling, meaning one house, and one accessory building, you know, often that'll be a, a garage or something like that. Um, yeah, in a, a open space or environmental open space or something like that, you might say, um, you know, these are areas where you allow for uh, maybe grazing, maybe nothing uh, in terms of development. Instead, you're looking at the development of trail systems or, uh, you know, conservation lands or uh, interpretive signage, um, things like that. A light industrial area would typically allow for things like, uh, you know, big, bigger open garages, um, larger structures. Um, then you're also thinking, you know, setback from lot lines and, and some of this more specific stuff that we don't have to get into today. Um, but municipal planning is all about being specific. It's all about saying, here's how far from your property line your house has to be. It has to be at least this distance and not more than this distance. Here's how far from your neighbor's house or from your side lot you have to be. Um, you know, how many, how many parking spaces you have to provide for certain uses, uh, things like that. It's, it's a very, very specific and intentional bylaw. And it can be great. Uh, it can also regulate the wrong things. And oftentimes zoning bylaws uh, do regulate the wrong things. Um, the city of Toronto, which I think has a really good, uh, you know, strategy for city planning. They're, they're trying to dig themselves out of a bit of a hole. Uh, and they have some of the some world class planners there uh, recently got rid of, for example, their parking minimums. So there's no such thing as minimum parking in the city uh, of Toronto. You can build anything you want. And if you give, you know, provide zero parking spaces, that's fine. Because the assumption is that people shouldn't have to drive. People shouldn't necessarily have to own a car in order to access areas. That's not a reality in the north yet. Uh, especially not, you know, kind of looking around, it's, it, there are bigger distances, a lot of people do need, in fact, to own cars uh, in order to, to live here. But within the city of Whitehorse, you know, uh, there's no reason why that has to be the case in the future. We could look forward to a future where owning a car is optional and you can get to work and get around town uh, on a, a public transit system. Um, which seems like a, you know, something that is, is highly stigmatized right now, uh, unfortunately. Um, so are there any questions about the, the planning scale stuff? This was kind of a quick and dirty overview of, uh, of the different scales of planning. So going back to this chart, you know, um, largest scales are the least detailed you know, going down to the smallest plans, most detailed, um, getting into some of those things. It, pretty good. Got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so at this point, uh, Yukon First Nations uh, under the UFA are really only involved in making their own regional plans. Is that correct? And they're not involved in, at this point in time, any, there's, they're not involved in sub regional district or any other ones, is that correct? I mean, uh, so, I mean uh, control, controlling them, I guess is what I meant. So uh, regional and local area planning. So uh, First Nations are active uh, parties in local area planning as well. Thanks, good clarification. Okay, uh, and now, yeah. now the, I know this is slightly off topic, but the, sure. are, the, are the regional resource councils, yep. are, the, are they, uh, they're quite at the forefront of the, the local area planning and the regional planning? Are they part of the, the process? So that's a great question. Uh, the RRCs, as they're known, the, the uh, regional resource count, renewable resource count, councils, I believe they're called. That's uh, right. <laughs> uh, are there in some final agreements as special provisions and they're not in others? So. In the umbrella final agreement, which is kind of the, the, the template one, uh, they are, their formation is mentioned, right? Uh, they will be involved and they will inform processes, uh, but it's a very general statement in the, in the UFA. 
in some first name, I know in in um, uh, in Trondequitchen's uh, final agreement, for example, uh, they have a special provision that says the Re the Renewable Resource Council will be part of the regional planning process for these specific points. They will be engaged in this way. They're, they're very specific about it. That doesn't exist in, uh, and I know it doesn't exist in, for example, Champagne Asia's final agreement, where their special provisions are, are about completely different things. So they might have a different role, uh, but they're always going to be engaged as uh, as stakeholders, at very least, uh, okay. because they, they do have very important knowledge. Um, okay. For the rest of you, uh, uh, renewable resource councils uh, exist across the territory, and I mean they advise on all uh, a whole bunch of different important matters. Uh, you know, wildlife, yeah, fish and wildlife, riparian, riparian habitats. Um, you know, the gamut. I don't know. It's it's pretty much everything. Um, but they're very they're they are very important. Um, the legal context around them can shift depending on where they are. I think they're they're still they're always an advisory anyway. I don't think that's uh, yeah. And, and but I get a follow up questions on the overlap part of it. Sure. Now, on the regional and the local area, if you have a the First Nations that are not in consensus on the overlap, mm -hmm. chances are that regional or local area plan will never go to the table. Is that correct? So uh, I mean, there's a few different decision points, but yes, there is a decision point at the very beginning of a plan where you, you uh, have to consent to enter into the plan with the other parties. Um, okay. You are allowed to make a plan just for your land uh, on your own. You don't, you know, if Kwanlin Dunn First Nation wanted to make a local area plan uh, just for their settlement lands, then they could go ahead and do that, uh, no problem. But if they want to create uh, a plan that really includes all of the the areas around their settlement lands so they're really doing a good job you know making sure they know uh what the neighbors think and and you know ultimately creating a better plan by having more people involved um you need to all consent to enter into that process together so uh you do have options if if other people really don't want to be involved and you need a plan on your land you can go ahead and do it uh, the same goes for Yukon government on commissioner's land. They're allowed to just go ahead and plan it. Um, but the best practice here is to wait until all parties are ready for it. So uh, one, I guess I've got one other follow-up question. Now, Little Sam and Carmax First Nation put together a regional plan, I think uh, a year or two ago. And I, I think they got it approved, but is that, that's for all their traditional area, not just their settlement land, is that correct? So I, uh, I haven't seen the plan myself. Okay. Uh, I believe that they, it was a proposal to enter into chapter 11 planning with the uh, territorial government. Um, so I think what they did, and I think this is very smart, is they created a plan of their vision for the area. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, they've got something already made that they can go to Yukon government and say, this is our vision. Now we want to plan together but we can tell you from day one what we want and what our people value about this land. Um, historically, uh, chapter 11 planning has been very contentious, as you might know. Uh, the Peel watershed uh, ended up you know, going to the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, and the reason for that is, is largely because Yukon government um, had far more capacity than, uh, than you know, Nacho and I have done First Nation. Um, and as a result, they, you know, they, I mean, they didn't really follow the process very well, but, but they were able to, uh, to tailor a plan, the second plan that they ended up creating, uh, they were able to tailor it to exactly what they wanted. Uh, and they felt that they were entitled to do that. Um, Nachanag Dunn was counting on capacity being provided throughout the planning process that they didn't receive. So other First Nations have looked at that and said, we don't want that to happen here. We're going to prepare uh, before we enter into a, a regional planning process. I know that to An Kwachong Council, um, uh, Carcross, Tagish, and, uh, and Kwan Dun First Nation uh, have a process going on called How We Walk with the Land and the Water, 
um, that is their attempt to prepare for a chapter 11 planning process as well. Okay, okay, that's great, thank you. It gets a little, yeah. No, no, it makes total Great sense. questions, yeah. And I really do like talking about this stuff. Um, any other questions about uh, these sort of planning things? Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Land use plans, um, are they, they're not legally binding, are they? Like they're, like how much authority do, do they have? Like. That's a great question. Uh, land use plans all have uh, some sort of enabling legislation. So um, for uh, regional planning, that enabling legislation is the umbrella final agreement, um, which gives them legal authority. So in that case, they are uh, legally binding. Um, a lot of the times, the details of it, like a, a bylaw, for example, that'll be created through regulation. So uh, the way it, it kind of works is there'll be the, the act or the legislation, which is like the high level, that's actually, actually the law. And then there will be regulations that kind of clarify and are more specific about how that law is, uh, you know, put into action. So sometimes plans uh, have enabling legislation and sometimes uh, the plans are, are actually done through regulation, um, but typically they are legally binding. Um, there's a lot of strategic plans might kind of veer into the, uh, the realm of, uh, you know, here's what we'd like to see here, values, you know, things like that. Um, but I know like zoning bylaws or uh, zoning regulations are all legally binding. Um, and yeah, yeah, typically they, sh they should be <laughs> legally binding and they should be enforced as well. Uh, enforcement can be very tricky, especially in large areas. Um, yeah, and I don't think on a, you know, regional scale or territorial scale regulation or uh, enforcement of regulations is a, you know, it's not an easy thing to do on, on these large land masses. So uh, I don't think they've really figured out a, a perfect system for that yet. Good question though. Especially when it comes to like jurisdiction and everything like that. I know that also is like, makes it really tricky. Mm -hmm. Like who's gonna enforce this? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and even, you know, if somebody legally has jurisdiction, but they know that it's uh, uh, going to step on the toes of somebody else, they might not want to. Um, mm. Yeah, definitely a big thing. Um, you see it with, I know an example here in, in the city of Whitehorse is, um, the city of Whitehorse is reluctant to enforce their zoning regulations in McIntyre subdivision, which is where uh, the home of Kwan and Dunn First Nation, even though that is, it's their job and nobody else is gonna do it. Um, they feel uncomfortable doing so. So we're working with them to, to address that now. Uh, but it's a great point, like, yeah, across jurisdictions, um, it's- Well, like, if KDFN doesn't have like the capacity to take that on, like, how are they gonna enforce it? But I could understand how, yeah, like it, it's, it all makes it all kind of um, tricky. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a long history of the city, uh, you know, being a part of a colonial system that they don't want to perpetuate. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we've agreed to these zoning bylaws and, and actually we do need a dog catcher up there, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's it, it can be a, a bit of a I mean, it's a tricky situation and, and yeah, it takes a lot of discussions. Great question. Any other questions? Okay. Right, okay. We're going to go on and we're going to talk about the plan presentation assignment. Um, the purpose of this is you're going to choose a plan um, and it can be any plan uh, that you find. Uh, so I have uh, examples uh, up on the website that you can choose from. Um, I might toss a couple more up there. Uh, I've seen some really cool ones uh, recently, but you know, if you want to take one of those ones uh, for this assignment, that's great. If you want to use one that uh, you know you you like more or, or you're interested in or anything like that, go for it. That's great. Um, it does not matter what plan you use or how old it is or anything. 
um, for this assignment. So um, the, the purpose of this is the, the presentation will hopefully be delivered uh, during class. Uh, if you're unable to do so, you can record a video and send it to me in, in place of that. Um, I know that some people uh, in the past haven't been comfortable presenting um, in front of the class for one reason or another uh, and opted to send me a video instead. That's fine. That works. Um, I think it would be beneficial to uh, you know your fellow students if, if you were to uh, present uh, to them as well. Um, so yeah, you can uh, you can meet with me at any time if you have any questions about this. Um, and then the uh, the criteria itself, uh, you know, you select a, a plan. So check you've selected your plan, um, and then you're going to create a presentation uh, with a slide deck. Um, you know, talking about what scale is this plan? You know, so is it a regional plan? Is it a local area plan? Usually it's in the title, uh, quite frankly. Um, uh, what kind of plan is it? You know, what is, what is the problem that this plan is trying to address? Um, what's the point of it? Why did they do it? Uh, what level of detail does it provide? Um, you know, what tools does it use to uh, try and reach the set goal? So when I say tools, uh, often it ends up being something like, um, you know, some policies and uh, a zoning regulation or something like that. Um, but it's kind of like the how of the plan. So the plan will lay out, here's, you know, here's what we want to accomplish, here are the problems. Uh, and then it'll say, here's how we think we can address these problems. Um, some plans, uh, you know, are far more articulate and actually say that. Uh, other plans aren't as good and you're you might be wondering, you know, oh, what problems does this plan address? And uh, I think that's an important thing as well. You know, if you end up with a plan and these things are unclear, you can present on that and be critical of the plan and say, I actually don't think this plan does address the problem properly. You know, that's great um, because, you know, being having that kind of critical thought about these things is very important. And I, I can tell you from, uh, from what I've seen out there, there, there's a lot of bad plans uh, out there. So uh, you might come across one, uh, heads up. Um, you know, in your opinion, uh, is it a good plan? Uh, why, if, it's, if you don't think it's a good plan, you know, why? How do you think it could improve? How do you think it could have been better or, or uh, dealt with, you know, the issue more appropriately? You can also ask, you know, is it even addressing the right issue? Is this thing totally targeted on the wrong problem? Uh, oftentimes that might be the case. Um, a lot of older plans, especially, they'll, they'll focus on, you know, oh, we wanna create a nice quiet neighborhood or we wanna create a nice, you know, whatever, when really they're, they're paving over a wetland in order to build it or something like that, right? Like they might, kind of not be focused on the right problem at all. Uh, there might be some larger, more important issue that they're not even talking about. Um, so keeping a head up for that, you know, you may or may not encounter that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to provide a 15 to 20 minute uh, uh, discussion on the, uh, you know, the plan that you choose. Um, as part of that, you know, take us through pieces of the plan and talk about them and let's, you know, let's have a look inside of these things. Uh, uh, yeah, after the, the class, you're, you're going to be asked to submit your uh, slide deck to me uh, so that I can, you know, go through it again and make sure I took it all in. Um, so yeah, and I, I will be looking at, you know, the visuals provided. Um, so yeah, um, oh yeah, don't, you don't have to feel like you have to write an essay on your slides. I know some of my slides uh, do have too much writing on them. I am aware of that uh, and it's something I'm working on. Um, but yeah, looking back on today's lecture, you know, this, this could have been better. <laughs> and uh, I'm not gonna be too hard on you for your slide decks. 
Uh, what I'm really looking for is, you know, that you've taken a good hard look at the plan and you've thought critically about it. Um, yeah, so you can uh, deliver it over Zoom or by a pre-recorded video. Um, and yeah, I think that hopefully that lays it out for you a little bit. Um, are there any questions about the, the plan presentation? Yeah, I just got a quick one. Uh, would the, if we were, if somebody chose not to do the presentation and just recording, would the be recording be played for the class? Uh, I think I'd ask permission, uh, oh, okay. you know, uh, to whoever's, you know, if you're the one providing the video, I would ask you permission to do so. Um, but yeah, I would like to do that if that's, a, if, you know, if that's okay with the person. Um, yeah. Good question. I've never had an option. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I've, you know, I've never had an option. So usually I'm just crapping my pants during my presentation. So <laughs> fair enough. That'll be me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, yeah, I, um, I probably will take people through, uh, you know, in some of our later uh, classes, I'll take you through some plans. Um, and I think this will tie really nicely into the final assignment, which I'm working on right now. So I can't, I don't have it for you yet, but uh, I think that um, the idea is that the, the story assignment and the plan presentation are, are, you know, both going to be relevant in the creation of your final assignment. Um, I think we're going to do a final assignment for this class. And uh, yeah, and hopefully it'll, it'll kind of bring in a few different ideas about what planning is, uh, what land management is, and, and how it should you know, maybe change up uh, in, in the future to incorporate Indigenous perspectives better. Any further questions? All right, I think. Okay, uh, I think that's that's all I've got for you tonight. Um, you can expect to see the uh, yeah your uh, your grades uh, for the first assignment uh, later this week. Um, yeah, thanks guys. This was great. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night.